Welcome back, Rock Grunts. This is Giovanni Reed's House of the Scorpion, Chapter 3. <coughs> Celia left in the morning, and Matt spent the entire day waiting for the children. He had given up hope when just before sunset he heard voices approaching through the poppy fields. He planted himself in front of the window and waited. There he is! See, Maria? I told you I wasn't lying, cried Amelia. Her hand rested on the shoulder of a much smaller girl. He won't talk to us, but you're about his age. Maybe he won't be afraid of you. Amelia pushed the girl ahead of her and fell back to wait with Stephen. Maria wasn't all that shy about coming up to the window. Hey, boy, she yelled, wrapping the glass with her fist. What's your name? Do you want to play? With one blow, she stole Matt's carefully prepared speech. <clears throat> he stared at her, unable to think of another opening. Well, is it yes or no? Maria turned toward the other. Turned toward the other. Make him unlock the door. That's up to him, said Stephen. Matt wanted to say he didn't have the key, but he was unable to get the words out. At least he isn't hiding today, remarked Amelia. If you can't unlock the door, open the window, Maria said. Matt tried, knowing it wouldn't work. Celia had nailed the window shut. He threw up his hands. He understands what we say, said Stephen. Hey boy, if you don't do something quick, we're going to go away, Maria shouted. Matt thought desperately. He needed something to interest them. He held up his finger, as Celia did when she wanted him to wait. He nodded his head to show that he agreed with Maria's demand, and he was about to do something. What does that mean? said Amelia. Beats me. Maybe he's a mute and can't talk, Stephen guessed. Matt raced to his bedroom. He ripped the picture of the man with a bullfrog sandwich from the wall. It made Celia laugh. Maybe it would make these children laugh. He ran back and, and pressed the newspaper against the window. The three children ran close to study it. What's it say? asked Maria. Read Stephen. <clears throat> what does it say? asked Maria. Ribbit on rye, read Stephen. Do you get it? It's a bullfrog going ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. It's between two slices of rye bread. That's pretty funny. Amelia giggled, but Maria looked uncertain. People don't eat bullfrogs, she said. I mean, not when they're alive. It's a joke, dum-dum. I'm not a dum-dum. It's mean and nasty to eat bullfrogs. I don't think it's funny at all. Save me from idiots, said Stephen, rolling his eyes. I'm not an idiot either. Well, lighten up, Maria, Amelia said. You brought me out here to see a boy, and if it was miles and miles across the fields, I'm tired and the boy won't talk. I hate you. Matt stared at the scene with con concentration. That wasn't the result he wanted at all. Maria was crying, Amelia looked angry, and Stephen had turned his back to both of them. Matt rapped on the window. When Maria looked up, he waved the picture and then wadded it into a ball. He threw it with all his force across the room. See, he agrees with me, cried Maria through her tears. This is getting weirder by the minute, said Stephen. I knew we, wouldn't, we shouldn't have brought the agent. <clears throat> I thought the boy would talk to a kid his own size, Amelia said. Come on, Rhea, we have to get back before dark. I'm not walking anywhere, the little girl flopped on the ground. Well, I won't carry you, fatso. Just leave her, said Stephen. He started walking off. After a moment, Amelia followed her. <clears throat> Matt was appalled. If the kid, big kids went away, Maria would be all alone. It was going to be dark soon, and Celia wouldn't return for hours. Maria would be alone with nothing but the empty poppy fields and the, the chupacabras, who came after dark and sucked your juices and left you dry like an old cantaloupe skin. Suddenly, Matt knew what he had to do. Maria walked a few steps from the window before sitting down again. She was shouting insults at the vanished Stephen and Amelia. Matt grabbed the big, big iron cooking pot Celia used to make mer, men, yeah, menundo. Sorry, do not speak Spanish very well. And swung it open before he could worry much about her reaction. She would be furious, but she was saving Maria's life. He smashed out the glass in the window. It fell like a tinkling, jangling mess to the ground. Maria jumped to her feet. Stephen and Amelia rose up instantly from the poppy fields where they'd been hiding. Holy frijoles, said Stephen. All three stood open-mouthed, staring at the empty hole where the window had been. My name is Matt. I live here. Do you want to play? Said Matt because he couldn't think of another thing to say. He can talk, said Amelia, after the first shock had died away. Is that how you usually open a window, kid? Stephen said. Stay back, Maria. There's glass all over. He stepped carefully to the opening and knocked out the remaining shards with a stick. He leaned inside to look around. Matt had to hold himself to keep from bolting to the other room. This is creepy. The window's nailed shut. What are you, some kind of prisoner? I live here, Matt said. You told us that already. Do you want to play? Maybe he's like a parrot and he only knows a few words, suggested Amelia. I want to play, said Maria. 
Matt looked at her with approval. The girl was struggling in Amelia's arms, obviously trying to get to him. Stephen shook his head and moved away. He looked like he was really going to leave this time. Matt came to a decision. It was frightening, but he had never had an opportunity like this before, and he might never have it again. He shoved a chair to the opening, scrambled up, and jumped. No, shouted Stephen, running forward to catch him. He was too late. A terrible pain lanced through Matt's feet. He fell forward, and his hands and knees landed on the shard of glass. He wasn't wearing shoes. Oh man, oh man, what are we going to do? Stephen pulled up Matt and swung him into a clear patch on the ground. Matt stared with amazement as blood dripped from his feet and hands. His knees sp sp sprouted rivulets of red. Pull out the glass, cried Amelia in a high, scared voice. Maria, stay away. I want to see, yelled the little girl. Matt heard a slap and Maria's shriek of outrage. His head was swimming. He wanted to throw up, but before he could, everything went black. He woke to the sensation of being carried. He was sick to his stomach, but worse than that, his body was trembling in a frightening way. He screamed as loud as he could. Great, panted Stephen, who supported Maria's shoulders. Amelia had his legs. <clears throat> Her shirt and pants were soaked with blood. His blood. Matt screamed again. Be quiet, shouted Stephen. We're running as fast as we can. The poppy is now blue, and the long shadows of the hills stretched away in all directions. Stephen and Amelia were jogging along a dirt path. Matt's breath caught his sobs. He could hardly get air. Stop, cried Amelia. We have to let Maria catch up. The two children squatted down and let Matt's weight rest on the ground. Presently, Matt heard the patter of smaller feet. I want to rest too, demanded Maria. It's miles and miles. I'm going to tell Dada you slapped me. Be my guest, said Amelia. Everyone be quiet, Stephen ordered. You've stopped bleeding, kid, so I guess you're not in too much danger. What's your name again? Matt, Maria answered for him. We aren't that far from the house, Matt. You're in luck. The doctor's spending the night. Do you hurt a lot? I don't know, said Matt. Yes, yes, you do. Yes, you do. You screamed, Maria said. I don't know what a lot is, Matt explained. I haven't hurt like this before. Well, you've lost blood, but not too much, Stephen added, and Matt began to tremble again. It sure looks like a lot, said Maria. Shut up, Idget. The other children rose, carrying Matt between them. Maria followed, complaining loudly about the distance and being called an Idget. A kind of heavy sleep sleepiness fell over Matt as he swayed along. The pain had died down, and Stephen hadn't lost... Stephen said he hadn't lost too much blood. He was too dazed to worry about what Celia would say when she saw the broken window. They reached the edge of the poppy field, and the last streaks of sunlight slid behind the hills. The dirt path gave way to a wide lawn. It was shimmering green, growing deeper with the blue light of evening. Matt had never seen so much green in his life. It's a meadow, he thought drowsily, and it smells like rain. They started up a flight of wide marble steps that shone softly in the darkening air. On either side were orange trees, and all at once lamps went out among leaves. Lights outlined the white walls of a vast house above, with pillars and statues and doorways going to who knows where. In the center of an arch was the carved outline of a scorpion. Oh, 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 came a flurry of a woman's voice as they swept down the stairs to lift Matt and Stephen in Amelia's arms. Who is he? asked the maids, and they were wearing black dresses with white aprons and starched white caps. One of them, a severe-looking female with deep creases down either side of her mouth, carried Matt as the others went the open doors. I found Tim in a house in the poppy fields, replied Stephen. That's Celia's place, the maid said. She's too stuck up to live with the rest of us. If she's hiding a child, I'm not surprised. Who's your father, kid? said the woman who was carrying Matt. Her apron smelled like sunlight, the way Celia's did when it came straight from the clothesline. Matt's the stared at a pin fastened to the woman's collar, a silver scorpion with its tail curved up. Beneath the scorpion was the name tag that said the Rosa. Matt didn't feel well enough to talk, and it did and it did and what did it matter who his father was anyway? He didn't know the answer either. He doesn't talk much, said Amelia. Where's the doctor? Stephen said. We'll have to wait. He's treating your grandfather. At least we can clean the kid up, said Rosa. The maids opened a door to reveal the most beautiful room Matt had ever seen. It had carved wooden beams on the ceiling and wallpaper decorated with hundreds of birds. Matt's reeling eyes, they seemed to be moving. He saw a couch upholstered with flowers that faded from lavender to rose, like the feathers on a dove's wings. It was to this couch that Rosa was carrying him. I'm too dirty, Matt murmured. He had yelled that before and climbing a Celia's bed with muddy feet. You can say that again, snapped. You can say that again, snapped Rosa. The other women opened a crisp white sheet and laid it over the wonderful couch before Matt was laid down. He thought he could get in just as much trouble for getting blood on that sheet. 
Rosa fetched a pair of tweezers and began pulling fragments of glass out of his hands and feet. Aye, she murmured as she dropped the bits into a cup. You're brave not to cry. But Matt didn't feel brave at all. He didn't feel anything. His body seemed far away as he watched Rosa's. She thought were a human she were an image on a TV screen. He screamed a lot earlier, observed Maria. She was dancing around trying to see everything that happened. Don't act so superior. You yell your head off if you get an itty bitty splinter in your finger, Amelia said. Do not. Do so. I hate you. Ask me if I care, said Amelia. Both she and Stephen watched in fa fascination as blood began to well out of Matt's cuts again. I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up, announced Amelia. This is a very good experience for me. The other maids had brought a bucket of water and towels, but they didn't attempt to clean Matt up until they gave Rose until Rosa gave them permission. Be careful, his right foot is badly cut, said Rosa. The air hummed in Matt's ears. He felt the warm water and suddenly the pain returned. It stabbed from his foot all the way to the top of his head. He opened his mouth to scream, but nothing came out. His throat had closed with shock. Oh god, there must be glass left inside, said Rosa. She grabbed Matt's shoulders in order not to be afraid. She seemed almost angry. The fogginess that had surrounded Matt has vanished. His hands, his knees had throbbed with more pain than he knew existed. I told you he was crying earlier, said Maria. Be quiet, said Amelia. Look, there's writing on his foot, the little girl cried. She tried to get close, but Amelia thrust her back. I'm the one who's going to be a doctor. Rats, I can't read it. There's too much blood. She snatched a washcloth and wiped Matt's foot. The pain wasn't as bad this time, but he couldn't help but moaning. You're hurting him, you bully, shrieked Maria. Wait, I can just make it out. Property of... The writing is so tiny. Property of the Alacran Estate. Property of the Alacran Estate? That's us. It doesn't make any sense, said Stephen. What's going on? Came a voice that Matt had heard before. A large, fierce-looking man burst into the room. Stephen immediately straightened up. Amelia and Steve... And even Maria looked alarmed. We found a kid in the poppy fields, father, said Stephen. He hurt himself when we thought the doctor... The doctor? You idiot. You need a vet for this little beast. The man had roared. How dare you defile this house? He was bleeding, began Stephen. Yes, all over the sheet. We'll have to burn it. Take the creature outside now. Rosa hesitated, obvious, obviously bewildered. The man leaned forward and whispered into her ear. A look of horror crossed Rosa's face. She instantly scooped up Matt and ran. Stephen dashed ahead to open the doors. His face had turned white. How dare he talk to me like that, he hissed. He didn't mean it, said Amelia, who was dragging Maria behind him. Oh, yes, he did. He hates me, Stephen said. Rosa hurried down the steps and dumped Matt roughly onto the lawn. Without a word, she turned and fled back to the house. End of chapter three. Hope you guys enjoyed in chapter four coming up.